actually, I'm going to base this to some degree. I'm not, I'm not going to repeat the epidemiological data and the, um, the, well, the, the, the future that we probably will all for ourselves experience with a lot of symptoms and years in disability. Uh, I'll leave that for yourself to imagine and uh, <laughs> suffer. Um, but I would like to focus in the talk a little bit on the uh, experiences we had in my own working uh, environment in Germany. So it's a high resource setting. And I really would like to invite you afterwards in the discussion to perhaps explain or contribute how this relates to your work in your country, in your setting. Now, this is a slide I actually used some years ago. Um, because I was so impressed with the development of palliative care out of the HIV AIDS um, treatment and um, epidemic in the African countries. At the first African Congress, I, was, I think it was the second one from the APCA, um, where all these people came together from the HIV services. And um, obviously, they hadn't grown up in palliative care, but came from the outside in. And this was so totally different to my experience that everything came out of cancer control, or perhaps some people out of pain management, chronic pain, but then mostly cancer pain. But then we noticed that in the years, it sort of began to grow from the um, indications from the, the, what would be palliative care became bigger. And um, I thought that in the developed countries, at least, there was more and more talk and discussion about neurological diseases. There was this huge thing about pediatrics, which also is not naturally in the developing countries, and chronic organ failure, cardiac, lung, and renal failure. And on the other hand, we noticed that in the um, from HIV, it also grew out to um, resistant tuberculosis, and there have been talk. I've been very impressed about an article talking about rabies as a palliative care indication in the Philippines. And with the Ebola um, epidemic, we also know that there's been lots of discussions whether this wouldn't be something that would truly require palliative care. And apart from that, in both settings, we had this discussion what to do with the elderly, nursing homes, dementia, three big topics coming to that in a minute. So there's these, this, this growing field. Um, sorry, this is the wrong one. Well, there's, okay, slides mixed up. Um, actually, what I would wanted to show is that it, in Germany, we still do have the, um, most of the patients we treat are cancer patients. We had some epidemiological data showing that by now it's still more than 80% of the patients that we treat either at home or in specialized units or even the GPs, if they count, it's still cancer diagnosis. But the percentage of patients is growing. And even with cancer, sometimes you find that with new cancer treatments, patients will survive longer. And some of the cancer diagnosis by now, we're talking more about chronic, uh, chronic illness. So patients still have cancer, but we know the prognosis will be for some years at least, and we will have to get them through that period of time. And even if it's shorter than sometimes, it may appear much more than um, the short time we had before. We still have most of our patients with cancer diagnosis. In the inpatient unit, for example, average length of stay is nine days. In the home care service, average length of treatment is 21 days. And that's pretty typical for our setting. So what happens if we do have patients who have a much longer prognosis, who have months and years to live, as Sean just said? And you can have some peculiar experiences. For example, we got contacted by the dialysis department repeatedly. Because when patients say that they don't want to continue on dialysis, then usually the renal expert is way out of his field of comfort. And so they asked us whether we could communicate with patients and sort of get them through this process of stopping dialysis. So I went on a home visit, for example, some time ago. And there was this patient who had declared that probably not right now, but in the near future, he would like to stop with dialysis. And he was completely insufficient. So it was clear after that it would be a matter of a few days, perhaps a few weeks, until he would die from renal insufficiency. So as a palliative care expert, I'm sitting there at the coffee table, table with his patient and his wife. And he's healthy. He's walking around. He's still working a bit. Um, and he's calmly explaining to me that he wants to stop dialysis and he wants to die but not right now, because there is one issue. They have a tenant in one of the flats who is very disagreeable, and he wants to get rid of that person. His wife would be too weak and would not be able to do that, and he has to finish that before he can die. <laughs> and you know, we got all this compassionate care and friendly and nice, and so I, I didn't know at all how to respond to that. But for the talk right now, I'd like to give you some examples which come from a different area, from the neurological diseases mostly. We got quite a number of patients by now with motor neuron disease, 
I'm going to start with that and some of the more rare diseases and also talk a bit about dementia as one of the main fields of interest right now, which is under discussion at least. So starting with some patients here, this is real life experience sort of. So this was somebody we got asked to care for who actually wasn't that ill at all. She's 80 years old, she's married, she's been a physician in her time. She's got two adult children who obviously live far away and can't care for her. Most of the care is done by her husband who's two years older and by some household help that they hired. Uh, she's got motor neuron disease for one year now. She can't really talk anymore, so it's, it's more a bulba form. Uh, and she's actually quite clever. What she uses is the iPhone, or the iPad in that case. So she can type in the words, and then she, does, she, put, she presses the translate button from German to German, so the iPad will then say what she has written. So it doesn't cost anything. It's available for many people in Germany, at least, and uh, works quite efficiently. Still needs her hands for that, though. And the main problems she has aren't actually that severe either. It's mostly the um, salivation is the real problem. She's a little bit dyspneic, especially if she walks around. The, the feet are better than, the legs are better than the arms. The weakness is mostly in the arms, as, as it is with some patients. And she's done already a lot of things. I don't know how familiar you are with that. Salivation as a problem in MND is quite frequent. The disease is rare, but that, that is a frequent problem. And there are ideas that you could use anything anticholinergic, basically. So you could use any antidepressant, for example. Um, but that hadn't worked. You can use scopolamine. Uh, and you can also inject Botox into the uh, sal salivary glands. That works for a few months, at least. That has been done once with moderate effect, but can be done. And the last thing is you can do radiotherapy to the salivary glands. Um, and that was the discussion whether she would want to have that and whether we think it's a good idea to do that. And actually, we treated her for about three weeks. We went there repeatedly. We discussed the options. We finally agreed that probably medical uh, trial, uh, drug treatment would be enough. We gave her a little bit of opioids for her uh, dyspnea, which works fine in these patients. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. And after that time, they sort of had settled down. We realized that a lot of the problems she had were due to lack of information. So she needed just more information on treatment options, on availability of treatment, on availability of services, and so on. And then we didn't hear from her for about eight months. This is just a sign how communication impairment, the typical sign with AL, uh, MND is that the the small muscles of the hand go first, and then writing, for example, becomes impossible. Uh, this is eight months later. She still looks pretty much the same. But by now, um, her weakness is much more progressed. Uh, the dyspnea has progressed. There are additional problems, not too frequent in palliative care, like flatulence. Um, and they sort of, again, had a problem to, you know, just with the organization of care, mostly. Symptoms, yes, but also organization of care. So we came back again, and for about three weeks, we treated her at home, had repeated home visits by the nurses, few by the doctors. Uh, we didn't have to do much. We increased the morphine a little bit. Um, but it became clear that they were just feeling uncomfortable at home. And so she asked for admission at the palliative care unit after about three weeks. And she stayed there for about a week and then died from pneumonia, which she didn't want treated. And this is a typical course of illness and cause of treatment for us. So the main thing here is that we say we can't treat these patients for eight months. So we have to decide clearly which times are the ones that they really need support. We go in and out of treatment. And we had a few weeks of intensive treatment, then we go back again, we wait till they call us or we have some kind of loose contact and find out when they won't need us. And then we come back again for the home treatment. And at times we know that we would have to admit them to the palliative care unit and sometimes in the end of life at least, patients would really want to have the security of the um, environment of the palliative care unit. Just in case you're not familiar with the disease, it's mostly motor, or basically the, the etiology is from the motor neurons. So there's no sensitive problems, there's no cognitive problems at all. And actually lots of the patients have that, one of the main issues is that they say, um, if this deteriorates more, if the muscles, if the weakness progresses more, but I'm still widely awake, I'm still fully conscious, and I, you know, I experience all this. They are afraid of suffocating, they're afraid of being paralyzed completely, um, and to, to talk about these anxieties and to talk about the options, do advanced care planning, for example, is really important. 
Uh, we also have to say that the literature out there says that the, there are no sensitive disorders, there are no cognitive disorders, but actually that's not true. Some of these patients do have sensory problems, and a lot of them have cognitive problems. The, the funny thing is, as a colleague taught me, and I, my own experience is the same, the patients really are very nice. They are really nice people. You love to be with them. And the family, is, they're getting totally on the nerves of everybody, mostly the family. So the family, the, the carers and the family usually are aggravated, they are aggressive, um, you have problems, they are overburdened, and the patient seems very nice for himself. If he's not really a nice person, then it's not MND. That's, you can say that. <laughs> and how to deal with that, how to feel out the tensions in the family, how to relieve people, how to um, give the caregivers enough relief, sometimes it's really difficult to arrange, even in a research-rich setting that we have. Uh, treatment itself is not that difficult. You, have, you can treat dyspnea, and the first important thing is that you can tell patients that till the very end of life you can relieve dyspnea. You usually use opioids, um, low doses, you can start, you can go higher. Um, only problem is that the, some of them say that their weakness is increased when they um, take the opioids continuously, and they only wanted PRN. Um, but the, and there's a study from another group in Germany saying that 95% of the patients will not have dyspnea until the very end of their life. And that is one very important bit of information that you have to give them because they don't know that usually. Um, there's also other things that I found, well, that I had to learn at least. So for example, we know that physiotherapy is a really important component of palliative care. But in these patients, you have to have special expertise in physiotherapy to care for them because there are different treatment goals. In the first phases of the disease, the physiotherapist would have to sort of try to work against the muscle weakness. So they would do training programs, for example. Uh, once the disease progresses, they would just have to do other kinds of physiotherapy to prevent contractions. Maybe do massage, for example. And at the very end, when patients are becoming paralyzed, then it would be more about pain relief, relaxation, about positioning, teaching the, the, the caregivers how to position the patient, for example. So the, the treatment goals of physiotherapy would change completely throughout the uh, course of uh, the disease trajectory. And similarly, with other um, issues, you would have to have special knowledge. For example, uh, PEG nutrition. Usually in palliative care, I would wait as long as possible before I suggest to a patient that we would want to go to uh, enteral nutrition via PEG. But in these patients, it's much better if you do it early on. If they want it at all, then you should do it early on. Because there's good uh, experience that if you do it late, when the respiratory capacity is decreased, then you're going to have problems. So you have to decide, discuss this very early in the disease trajectory. And then if they say, I want this, then you have to do it early enough. And similarly, there's huge discussions, ethical discussions with the patient on uh, ventilatory therapy. Do they want non-invasive? Do they want invasive therapy? Um, it's quite known that the non-invasive therapy might prolong survival for up to six months, or even in some patients up to two years, um, though the quality of life might not be good. And um, tracheostoma and invasive ventilation might even prolong it for more than two or three years, though most patients will be completely paralyzed without the eyes and the mouth um, after one, or three, one to three years. And the, the interesting thing is that these patients usually are very keen to discuss advanced directives and do ACP. But they also are the ones we find who do change their preferences. So we had, you know, this is the patient who comes to your unit with eight pages of advanced directive. Everything detailed. You know, I don't want more than six hours of non-invasive ventilation in the night. If this happens, then I want to, this to be discontinued. They are very, very, very clear on that. But you reach that point. You talk to the patient and he says, well, no, actually, let's go on. Let's do more. So those are the patients where we think they have done advanced directives with, which restrict treatment, but once you reach that point, they say, no, I don't want that, do more. And so this is really ACP, isn't it? That you keep talking about it. You don't say, we solved that, we got it on shelf. You have to repeat the discussion uh, again and again. Um, with advanced disease, you may have completely different problems. So this is another patient who lived um, for some years now, more than five years actually, with motor neuron disease. The usual time of survival from the time of diagnosis is two to five years, so he's really at the upper range. But there are some forms which, where you can live longer. 
And he didn't live at home anymore. He lived in a flat with three other patients who were severely disabled, and they had this kind of a nursing service that cared for them in that flat. He was on mechanical ventilation. He was communicating only with eye movement, but with the computer, which worked quite well. And there were lots of smaller problems. This is the uh, PEG site. You can see the, the old PEG site. This is the new one. Whenever he got nutrition here, it came out there. So it didn't work well. And the question, you, you would have to either revise it surgically or do something different. And the problem is he didn't want to go to hospital because with his kind of disability, he was afraid to be cared for by, by, by hospital staff. He said he's, last time he's been in hospital, it's been terrible. They disconnected his ventilation and didn't sort of didn't care. And he was near suffocation just because of a nursing problem. And um, so he was really afraid to go into hospital. He said, I'll, I'll go if someone accompanies me. But there was nobody from the nursing service who could do that. So actually, part of the, the, the treatment we had to do here, the care we had to give, was to find out whether one of our team, of our mobile team, could go with him to the hospital, could arrange it in a way that this is done in a one-day thing, not overnight, and then get him back home immediately and all the time stay with him and care for him. And this is actually what we did afterwards. He got an intravenous port and uh, one of us went with him for the whole time and that really was the thing he needed. We had to find out a way to, treat, uh, to uh, give him nutrition in the meantime. It's like uh, not really easy with somebody who's been uh, treated that way for some years now, so with only the, some small veins in the leg. Um, and he also taught me something about communication because this is the kind of communication you have with these patients. They have the computer and a camera. The camera looks at his eyes um, he looks at the letters on the computer, and if he looks long enough at the letter, then the letter will be printed. It takes an awful long time. So you say, how do you do? And if he says, I'm fine, thank you, that sort of you can watch slowly as the letters appear on the screen. And uh, we didn't have much time. We had half an hour for, till we had to go to the next patient. So we started completing his sentences once we realized what he was going to say. And he didn't like that. He kept on typing till the last point at the end of the sentence. <laughs> and we got, you know, we got a bit aggravated and he still insisted on that we let him talk his piece. And uh, so I learned it's really important that you think about the proper way of communication with these patients. Even if they can't talk, it's very, very important that you respect them as a person and this means also that you let them finish their sentence, for example. There are some problems which challenge the team, again, from this palliative care position that you should be compassionate and that you should find optimal solutions for the whole family. Um, he came to the palliative care unit, to the inpatient unit, for symptom control, but it became clear, clear quickly that one of the main things would also be that he needed an, a good, really good advanced directive. He didn't have one, he wanted to have a really good one. And they drafted one which again stated that in that and that case, I don't want nutrition, I don't want ventilation. Um, we had to improve symptom management as well. We had to put in a urinary catheter. And then it became clear that mostly when discussing the advanced directive that there were some deeper problems with that actually. He was living in a flat. Um, well, no, he lived actually in the house they owned, but the family had gone out of the house into a flat. So they were paying right now for flat and house. Um, because it was clear that the family, especially the kids, they, they could not bear with the effort of care for that patient. For the, they came to visit, that was fine, but they didn't want to be around the whole time. They were suffering from that. This is what, how the family put it. And everybody expected the patient to die in about half a year. And with symptom control and maybe other factors, the patient was not dying. And after some time, he said that actually he has decided by now that it's, I mean, all this looks quite good. And uh, in spite of the advanced directive, he thinks that he probably will stay home for another year. And then he can th see how this develops and maybe um, decide just, you know, come back with the family or don't know what. Let's see. And the family was desperate because they said, this is not how we planned it. And we have run out completely of money. We can't have the flat and the house. We'll be homeless. We, we don't know what to do. Um, and um, somebody has to tell him that we got a right to live as well. So he should, they, they wanted to urge him to follow his advanced directive and stop treatment. How do you deal with that? And it wasn't enough to tell them that they should just bear with it. 
And um, actually, the first good thing we found out is that we got them to talk to each other and sort of at least have an understanding of the feeling. And there are some social security options in Germany which you can use then. So we found a way that both were not too unhappy about it. And he died about half a year later out of some complication. But this kind of discussion, I didn't have that at any time with, with cancer patients, for example. This was something completely new. And this is for MND, where by now we do have some experience. There are some other more rare diseases which I find even more challenging at times. So this is, for example, a patient with Creutzfeldt-Jakob, uh, CGD. I don't know whether you had patients with that disease yet. Um, it's, it's even rarer. And um, the, the usual time of survival is about half a year from the time that we see them. Uh, in the books, it says something half a year to two years, but my experience is it's shorter. So this patient, we've seen her um, just before Christmas, and um, our feeling was she was deteriorating so rapidly, we thought that um, this is a matter of a few weeks. I mean, if she lives to Christmas, that, that'll be good. And it was really difficult to discuss that with the family. She's got two sisters who care for her, really intense. She's got an old mother who doesn't speak German. And, uh, well, yes, um, obviously also didn't know how to treat her. Um, at one home visit, we saw that the mother was feeding the patient who had a PEG nutrition and was intubated. And so all the food went probably straight into the trachea and stopped short of the tubus. Um, but it wasn't possible to explain that to the mother. Uh, on the other hand, the care by the family was really good. Uh, we sent them home. Uh, we sent the, the patient home. She lived till Christmas. We thought that this is a matter now for a few more weeks. Um, and actually, she's still living. That's two years ago now. My wife is her GP. She visits them from time to time. And um, it's, it's astonishing, but she's even a little bit better by now. There are some problems which we met in between and throughout the course of disease, um, because the, um, this disease obviously is so highly infectious with the prions that you have to take special cautions. You have to uh, disinfect, for example, any instruments that you use. And she had to have a gastroscopy in between. And there were three or four of the hospitals in our hometown that didn't want to do the gastroscopy because they could throw away the instrument afterwards. We had the, the procedure in Germany is that you have to send to the University of Göttingen about four hours drive away, and they will send one of these instruments. You can use that, send it back. They have, are the only ones in Germany who can do this kind of specific disinfection. Till we found that out, this cost hours of coordination. And we had to find a unit, when she needed the, the procedure, we had to find a unit first that would admit her, because the nurses and the physicians are really afraid to have some of these patients in their unit. And so lots of them just said they won't do it. And actually, the, the hospital that took it, her then, I think they didn't realize the kind of disease she had, to be very honest. And we didn't explain too much, so <laughs> On, only afterwards. So, I was way out of my depth with the, with the knowledge about the disease. I had to read a lot, talk to people, find out things. I didn't know about the procedures. This was something completely unfamiliar to me. One of our workers, co-workers really had to spend a lot of time on the phone and talk to people and check on, on Google um, how to do this correctly. We had a lot of time to find other people who pre were prepared to treat these patients. And uh, this, this took up so much time for this one patient. So, out of proportion with anything else that we have. And for any other rare disease, we're working with the center of rare diseases of the university, for example. Anything else they pitch at us, same thing. It's, it's way out of our field of expertise. We have to really look very carefully what we can do, what we have to do, and it's much more um, than we would need. This, uh, this dementia should be printed bigger, I think. Um, the question now for me is, how do you translate this kind of experience into some rules, guidelines, procedures? What, what do you make out of that? I mean, it's quite good to have this kind of experience, but do we, what do we do with that? And more specifically, perhaps, what do we do with, with it, not for the few patients with MND, where we feel quite comfortable, but for the vast majority of patients that we just talked about, you know, the epidemiology that we have in front of us with the patients who are demented, who are frail elder, uh, frail and old, and um, there is similarly a discussion on how to treat patients in nursing homes, because that's one of the white spots, even in most developed countries, where you have good palliative care in the home, but not in the nursing home. How do you reach patients there? And there's a large degree of overlap, so when you discuss things about nursing homes, most often it's also a discussion about dementia, 
and frail elderly, but it's not exactly the same, so you have to be aware that there are differences. For the European Association, some time ago, we decided to focus on the dementia issue first. And so I'm very grateful to Jenny van der Steen, um, epidemiologist from the Netherlands, who took this on as her own personal quest. Um, she put in a lot of energy to, find, uh, to formulate a white paper on palliative care and dementia, which was published last year. I'm really grateful for her to push that forward. These are the domains that we covered, applicability, uh, what are the core elements, setting goals, continuity of care, prognostication, and avoiding overly aggressive treatment. Um, one of the things I was interested in, how is this different from palliative care that we do elsewhere? I mean, we do have our palliative care standards, and much of the discussions in that expert group actually was pretty much the same that we had discussed for cancer or even for HIV, same, same things all over. So, I mean, person-centered, this is not really specific, is it? I mean, we do that all the time. But one of the things I found interesting is that they quite clearly stated that usually when you have this um, binary differentiation that you have either curative or palliative treatment goals, that would be different in dementia. There would actually be a threefold treatment goal partition. You would have prolongation of life at the early stages, then you would have maintenance of function in the medium and maxim uh, maximum of comfort in the later stages with more severe disease. So there is obviously some fundamental difference. You can argue whether that also translates into the curative palliative goals, but I think this is what the dementia experts also told us, that you have these threefold partition, and I found that rather interesting. The, the, the major discussion was at what stage would you want to palliative care to get started then? Um, is it like with a diagnosis of dementia, you have to get in palliative care expertise, or is it only for the ones that develop cancer, or pain, or other symptoms, or only for the late stages, only for the dying patients? And um, the, the, the sentence or the statements we put down in the paper then were that it can be realistically regarded as a terminal condition. condition. So, the, the, I mean, the discussion breaks down on do you die from dementia or with dementia? And so the, the baseline from that paper was that you die from dementia in the long run. But it can also be characterized as a chronic disease or as a geriatric problem. And the goals of care can be considered appropriate, of palliative care, sorry, can be considered appropriate in dementia throughout the disease trajectory. So you can start with palliative care at the onset, at, at the time of diagnosis, but you have to realize that at that stage it's probably not that important and that the emphasis on particular goals, most specifically on the palliative care goals, will be changing over time throughout the disease course. It was also clear that you need palliative care on, on a general, on a basic level, and that probably very early on, and specialist palliative care might be more important in the later stages of disease. This, this is probably something everybody here in the room could sign. Uh, we also discussed, which I found very comforting, that just saying that it, could, that it is a terminal condition, or it can be regarded as a terminal condition, and that palliative care might be appropriate, obviously is good for the patient. There are some studies saying that um, if you agree that it's a terminal disease, then you can have greater comfort in the patients because they are being uh, treated appropriately, and symptoms, for example, are assessed and treated. And even, I like the last study, uh, labeling dementia, as dementia care as palliative care might itself result in improved patient care because it's just if the focus changes slightly and that obviously is good for the patient. I think if you look at these kind of consensus documents, it's, sometimes it's more important to look at the points where you have less consensus or even dissent, the, the points that are under discussion. And for that, the expert group that produced the paper, we had about half and half palliative care experts and dementia care experts. And so what are the, the critical points between the two of them? One thing was definitely the target group and the prognostication, both of them re are related in some way. So how important is it to have a good prognosis, to, be, you know, to identify the, the dying patient, for example? And the dementia care people said, more often than not, this is not that important. We just treat according to the severity of symptoms. Whereas the palliative care people said, well, yes, it, all, it also influences treatment goals. There's a lot of decisions to be made, so it might be really important. We ha would have to look at instruments. We would have to develop our prognostication skills, which are much, much less developed for this patient group. 
And similarly, the palliative care experts said that, but on the other hand, we'd like to start palliative care from the time of diagnosis. And the dementia care experts said, well, actually, you should come in for the severely ill and the multimorbid and the cancer patients. You're, you're the ones we call at the end of life for these patients. And it became, for me, it became quite important to realize that it's not like, you know, we, are, we, we may say that this is all palliative care. They, they all need palliative care. But we still have to do with experts in um, adjacent fields of care who might, might think different and who might feel even a bit threatened if now these palliative care guys come in and want to take away their patients. There were also some problems. Uh, the other two um, issues were on um, uh, too aggressive, overly aggressive treatment, hydration and enteral tube nutrition. Um, well, there's lots of evidence out there that this is not really beneficial and should be at least discontinued in the dying phase. And uh, for example, I found it very interesting that this, there are systematic reviews out there saying that enteral nutrition is um, actually bad for the patient. There's a high rate of complication and survival is not improved compared to skillful hand feeding. And probably the main reason why this is not done is because it takes much more staff to do skillful hand feeding. And many countries don't have that. So prognostication, we know this slide from Scott Murray has used that repeatedly, um, but we know that the, with cancer we are finding it much easier to sort of deal with a steep descent in the last phase of the disease, and it's much more difficult for the chronic illnesses and for the frail and for the demented um, how to identify the right point of entry for palliative care. Mostly right now, my own experience with dementia has been patients with dementia and cancer. So this is somebody with severe dementia, uh, who had developed um, some cancer. Well, you see the skin metastasis. We didn't even find the primary, and there was no way we could even do any diagnosis or treatment. It was not possible with the patient. And we had some ethical discussions with the family, with the treating physicians, with the oncologist, whether it's okay not even to look. Do you do diagnosis? I mean, it could well be that the cancer behind this could be treated but we didn't find any option to, to, it would have been very, we would have to been very aggressive to the patient if we wanted to do diagnosis and treatment. And we finally decided, no, it's fine, we can just let the cancer go on and just give him comfort care and not even check the therapeutic options. And this kind of, this happened often, so, well, not often, but sometimes. With the, um, we did have to develop our own skills to some degree at least. So you know this in dementia care, there's a wealth of experience how to deal with cognitively impaired patients. Um, you, you know, don't overburden them, don't ask too many questions, uh, do instructions in small sentences and so on. And we had to do that. We also had to develop our own uh, ingenuity. This is uh, from the palliative care unit in Aachen. We had this slightly demented patient who was able to find the smoking room but didn't find his way back. And so what happened is that he stood in any of the patient rooms. Usually we, we found out because one of the old patients was shrieking and then we sort of got him back into his room. And uh, we thought we couldn't restrict him, but the easy way is to you would just put some, uh, um, some arrows on the floor and he just followed the arrows and to his own room was fine. And this kind, I like this kind of thinking, you know. This, I was very impressed with my team at that stage. Um, there are other diseases where we still struggle whether this is a palliative care indication. I mean, how, what do you do with stroke? Do you, do you have patients with stroke in your palliative care? It's a good question, I think. And um, even if we decide that this is an example where um, we had lots of discussions um, whether there should be treatment, comfort care only, whether there's anything else, active treatment, rehabilitation, we finally decided with the family that we would let the patient die and don't do any real treatment, just do comfort care. And uh, um, even if we agreed in our team, we would still have to discuss with the sickness funds, with the funders, and they might not accept this. And last case, coming to the end, um, this is the patient we had only very recently who has anorexia. Um, she had that for about 40 years, but it became worse the last year. And she was treated in the university hospital. By now she had a BMI from 10, 24 kilos, one meter 60. Um, and the question was, do you continue treatment or not? The family by now, they had said all the time they wanted her to be treated, but by now they said they've been worn down, they don't know how to proceed with this. 
Um, we had lots of input from the psychosomatic and the psychiatric department. Unfortunately, it was in the contrary direction. The psychosomatic guy said that below a BMI of 13, the survival is improbable. You can't treat them effectively. So with this kind of stage, uh, you can't really do much. And the psychiatric guy said, this is depression, organic depression. We treat her, and then we can start feeding her. The patient herself, you could still talk to her, um, said that everything's fine. She's eating enough. She wasn't eating anything. And if need be, she might, be, she might accept food, but right now all's good. She doesn't need food. And um, if we want to feed her, she made it very clear that that would be disgusting, absolutely re revolting. For her, that would be really violence. What do you do with that? So we finally had an ethics committee in there and uh, tried to discuss that with support from external support and agreed that it would be OK not to feed her. We would do comfort care, but not feed her. And she died about two days later, which sort of confirmed the decision, because I think even with treatment, she wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have been able to have her survive. Um, but the, the kind of, this is again way out of our depth. We don't know whether anybody would agree that this is palliative care. And we would have to negotiate with the funders, with the reimbursement, with the sickness funds. Um, and it's questions, I mean, this has been going on for 40 years now. We are only called in at the end stage of this. We know that if we don't care for her, nobody else will in the university hospital. The psychiatric guy, for example, when he said that this is depression, it has to be treated, he made it also quite clear that not in the psychiatric department. <laughs> Always easy, yeah. So the end. Um, I think my experiences have been with chronic illness that we do have to have different approaches to that. It's like we have to decide on how long can we treat patients. And it's more like we know that we have intense periods, uh, periods of intense treatment, but then we also have to withdraw again, let the usual system with the GPs and the nursing services do it, and then come back again when needed. So we have the full opportunity, the full range of options available for the patient, but we have to negotiate all the time what, what level of care do they need, and we have to adapt constantly. Uh, we need additional skills, for example, on communication with these patients who are often severely disabled in communication or cognitively impaired. Uh, we have to take great care that the caregivers in the family are not overburdened. They usually, I mean, it's, it's a difference whether you do this for a month or two or for five years or longer, and whether they have adapted all their life to that. But we also have to care for our own team caregivers, because they also are often overburdened, and these are often challenging situations with a family that are not easy to deal with. And most important, I think we have to realize that we're not alone out there. There are other specialists caring for these patients. And we have to be very careful that we don't are seen as competitors in the field who want to take away the expertise in that area. And we have to make it very clear that we want to do this only in collaboration. We can bring the special knowledge in communication, ethics, and symptom management to the patient. But we should do that always in collaboration with the other experts that are already there. And I think that way we probably can find a good way to treat patients with chronic illnesses with the knowledge that we have developed for HIV or for cancer. Thank you very much.